2018. It's done with. It's over. It has been for almost two months now, but that hasn't stopped me from trying to go back and catch up on all the movies that I have not seen or talked about yet. But seeing as how Oscar Sunday is upon us, or has passed already, depending on when I actually upload this video, I figured now's the time to move on from 2018 so I can move on to all the 2019 movies that I'm already late with seeing and or talking about. So here is a list of all of my favorite movies of 2018. This is just my personal favorites list, so don't at me. Also, everything on this list is ranked alphabetically, so let's start off with Avengers Infinity War. This film is definitely my favorite movie of 2018. Because, duh, of course it is. I'm a huge Marvel fan, and this movie blew all of my expectations out of the water. Infinity War is one of the most satisfying theatrical experiences that I've ever lived through, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. I hate that people have to justify themselves for liking popular movies, simply because they're popular. Remember when Lord of the Rings was popular? Shit, Return of the King swept at the Oscars at one point in time. The love poured into the characters and the technical craft required in the filmmaking process may be different, but it is still the love and craft that made this movie so phenomenal. This is the culmination of a 10-year journey, brought together by 20 films in an interconnected cinematic universe. The fact that this movie works at all is a miracle. Everyone will remember how they felt after seeing Infinity War. Everyone will remember comparing this movie to The Empire Strikes Back. I had a blast watching this movie, and I can't wait to see how it concludes once Endgame finally arrives. Bad Times at the El Royale. This movie is just plain fun. It feels much like a stage play filmed for the big screen. It has clever dialogue, memorable characters, great action, and a fascinating story structure. I didn't make the comparison at the time, but Bad Times at the El Royale definitely does feel like a Quentin Tarantino film. Some people say that with a negative connotation, but I don't understand why. I love Tarantino films, and Tarantino only makes one movie every few years. Why wouldn't you want more films in that style? Like if Tarantino had helmed this film instead of Drew Goddard, would it have been received any differently? I don't know man, that's up for the viewer to decide, but I personally loved Goddard's work here. Black Panther Probably one of the most important films in recent memory, Black Panther forced its way into the pop culture zeitgeist without any remorse. It may stick to Marvel's safe formula, but it showed Hollywood how important diversity and representation in film can be. Is it better than Logan or The Dark Knight? Fuck no. But it didn't come out in 2017 or 2008. It came out in 2018. And you better believe that it is one of the best films of 2018. I'm glad it received the Best Picture nomination. Going back to my point earlier about popular movies, this year proved that comic book films can be works of art too. Blind Spotting. This is one of the most underappreciated films of last year. It is clever and funny and personal and socially relevant. There's not much to not appreciate in this movie. I really dug the tone that was set by David Diggs and his company. A lot of movies this year were recognized for their diversity and representation of black lives in cinema, but none of them quite connected with me like Blindspotting did. Aside from the hate you give. I'm honestly surprised that this movie did not receive a lot of recognition this award season. It is critically under-recognized. Amanda Stenberg carried this film, which deals with some pretty serious themes, on her back. Thematically, it is quite similar to Blind Spotting, and it does deal with similar issues, but the tone is far more serious and dramatic. It can be lighthearted in places due to Star Carter's youth, but that never keeps the movie from feeling real. It is grounded in an unfortunate sense of realism. The narrative that the story tells is all too common nowadays, which makes the story feel all the more heartbreaking. Mission Impossible Fallout. Now here's a movie that doesn't have heavy themes or social relevancy, but is still fucking phenomenal. I don't know how it happened, but Mission Impossible easily became one of the best action franchises of all time. Christopher McQuarrie is a masterful action director. He had me in edge of your seat suspense for nearly the entire runtime of the movie. 
I don't even know how he managed to film some of the sequences that were shown at this point. I think Fallout could have been a satisfying conclusion to the series, but I'm glad McQuarrie signed on to direct two more of these bad boys. I think McQuarrie is the only man capable of directing great Mission Impossible films anymore, and I hope he does helm a satisfying conclusion if Mission Impossible 8 is going to be the last entry in this franchise when it comes out in 2022. A Quiet Place who would have thought that Jim Halpert of The Office fame would go on to direct an iconic horror film? Now, I know John Krasinski has dipped his toes into more serious roles before, but this is really his best dramatic work. It's just even more impressive that A Quiet Place is also his directorial debut. I especially admired how the movie wasn't a simple monster flick. The narrative of A Quiet Place is admittedly simple, but thematically, this is a movie that has a lot to say about family and loss and grief and how to love someone when dealing with guilt. It's a simple story, but it's executed excellently. On top of all of that, the premise allowed for one of the most satisfying theatrical experiences that I have ever had. Everyone in the theater had to be quiet in order to enjoy this movie and a silent auditorium filled with people trying to simply watch a movie felt nothing short of glorious. Ready Player One I don't care what anyone has to say about it, because Ready Player One is easily the best Spielberg movie in years, maybe even his best movie in decades. You're damn right that includes Lincoln and Tintin and Munich. Those movies are boring, they bore me, I don't give a shit about them. But this movie harkens back to the fun and youthful and nostalgic tone that can be found in Spielberg's earlier work. It felt like a blast from the past, and I'm not just referring to all of the pop culture references. I mean it was nice to have a movie that felt similar in tone to Jurassic Park, or E.T. the Extraterrestrial, in a narrative that wasn't all that similar in structure. And even with all of the pop culture references, I still don't think that this is a bad movie. We've all seen VR chat and Ugandan Knuckles. The Oasis is exactly what a future version of the internet would look like. If anything, the Oasis didn't go far enough with all of its references, because today's society floods the internet with memes and references and easter eggs as it is currently. You know it's true, don't act like it's not. We just got to see that pan out in movie form. Ready Player One is just a fun romp that kept a stupid smile on my face from beginning to end. Searching. I have a great respect for this movie. Director Anish Shiganti was trying to create a simple and cheap independent film. Utilizing the found footage computer screen technique was a means to implement both of those aspects, and the result is a truly unique experience. Searching is a great, suspenseful thriller that is filled with plenty of emotional moments. I'm not afraid to say that Searching was one of the only films of last year that actually had me tear up while watching it. The only other movie being The Hate You Give. It may be blasphemous to say, but the first five minutes of Searching rivals the first five minutes of Up For Me in terms of emotional visual storytelling. The writing is great, the performances are great, and the story is engaging, and it's all done by using a camera trick that never feels gimmicky. Solo A Star Wars Story Fuck you, I love this movie. I admit it has flaws, I admit it can often be too dark to see, I admit that the story is okay even at regular blockbuster standards, let alone Star Wars standards. I admit that the plot feels like a stupid checklist of things Han Solo has to do in order for the audience to recall the person he is to eventually become in A New Hope. I admit all of these things. And yet, I love the movie anyway. I don't think I've seen any other movie last year more than I've seen Solo A Star Wars Story. If I want to watch a fun little movie, I'll pop on Solo. If I want to have some background noise on as I work on another task, I'll pop on Solo. If I want to watch a Star Wars movie and can't decide which one, I might just pop on Solo. It's a fun and simple little romp within the Star Wars universe. It harkens back to the simplicity that was found in Star Wars back in 1977. I admire Ryan Johnson's more complicated take on the franchise, but Star Wars should be simple and accessible to mainstream audiences. This is a movie for everyone, a fun space western film that you can pop on at any point of the day. Could it have been better? Absolutely. But I still love it. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse I think I figured out why I don't love this movie as much as everybody else. 
Yes, it's on my favorite movies list, but that's really only because I kept wanting to go back and watch the film after everyone was claiming it was the best thing that they had ever seen. Like, I wanted it to be my favorite Spider-Man movie of all time, or my favorite comic book movie of the year, but it's just not. It's my fourth favorite Spider-Man film, and my third favorite comic book movie of last year. And I think that's all because of Miles Morales. Everyone loves Miles Morales, and while I enjoyed his big screen debut, and found his character to be incredibly endearing, I thought he was a bit overshadowed by Peter Parker in his own movie. I was far more interested in the interpretation of the original Spider-Man than I was with Miles' ultimate incarnation. I find myself invested in the story of Peter Parker, or even Peter B. Parker, more than I do with Miles' own story. It's a compelling story, and even an important one, one that needed to be told. But I'm not gonna lie, if the focus of the movie was solely on a version of Peter Parker going through a midlife crisis, I probably would've enjoyed the film a lot more. This isn't Miles' fault, he has a great character journey, but Spider-Verse does have a lot going on, and introduces a lot of characters. It's only natural that I found some characters to be a little bit more interesting than others. I know all of this sounds blasphemous, and I'm probably gonna get a lot of hate for it, but fuck it, I still love the movie. It's still one of my favorite movies of the year, because it's a damn good one, and it deserves to be seen. Finally, A Star Is Born. Bradley Cooper delivered one of the best directorial debuts of last year. It's a shame he didn't get nominated for Best Director, because he deserved that nomination. He was robbed of it. His film is so big and popular, yet so personal and intimate at the same time. Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper had the best on-screen chemistry together. They're so electric together that I wouldn't mind watching a VH1 reality series on the couple if their characters were actually real. I enjoyed watching the first half of their relationship more so than the second half, but that's neither here nor there. What's more important is that the music in this film has been stuck in my head since October. Everyone and their mother is singing Shallow. It's even playing on the radio. I can't wait to see the duo perform the song live, and I can't wait to see what Bradley Cooper's next directorial effort will be. So those are all of my favorite movies of 2018. Thank you very much for watching.